Hello and welcome to Inside Exercise. I know I keep saying I just had a great chat and whatever, but this one was just magnificent with the legend, Jerry Dempsey from Wisconsin, who has been the go-to guy, the best track record in respiratory physiology and exercise for 40 or so years. Uh, we discussed all sorts of things, um, including regulation of respiration, whether the respiratory system can become limiting to exercise performance and VO2 max, whether you can train the respiratory system. Um, we spoke about sex differences, the fact that a lot of people with asthma may actually have laryngeal dysfunction. And believe it or not, we also discussed putting nasal strips on horses. So stick around. I'm sure you'll enjoy this one. Hi, Jerry. How are you? Grand. How are you doing down there? Good, good. All right. So you've been around this area for, forever, and it's been great the excitement on Twitter about when um, I said that you're coming on. So, uh, you know, your wealth of knowledge around everything to do with exercise, uh, you know, respiratory muscle adaptations to exercise, um, limits to limits to exercise performance in regards to the lungs, etc. I wonder if we can just start off talking about, you know, how does the respiratory system respond just to acute exercise? So you, you start exercising, you know, what, what actually happens? Well, there are several elements to the respiratory system, right? There's the central nervous system that controls our breathing, the brain stem mainly, but the higher areas as well. Then there's the respiratory muscles. And uh, then there's the lung parenchyma and the alveolar capillary surface. And there are the airways. So all of these have to have a so-called adaptation or response to exercise. And, and for the most part, with some noted exceptions that we can get into later if you want, the response is nearly perfect. It's highly precise because the lung's main function is to control the arterial blood gases. No matter what happens on the venous side, as the muscles produce more carbon dioxide and the partial pressure of CO2 and the mixed venous blood coming back to the lung can rise up to 90 to 100 millimeters of mercury in very heavy exercise. And the oxygen can fall down to five to 10, 15 millimeters of mercury on the venous side. So it has to take all that and make it come out looking just like it is at rest on the arterial side. And it does that, does it beautifully. Um, but it's not just that it's precise, it's also highly mechanically efficient because you don't want the arterial blood gases to be maintained normally at any cost. You want it at a minimum cost and that's what it does. For example, the cost of breathing, the oxygen cost of breathing in a normally trained person at maximum exercise is no more than eight, nine, 10% of the total oxygen consumed by yeah. the body. That's pretty good. Um, the um, the uh, pressure pressures of, or the pressures of oxygen of a pressure, excuse me, in the pulmonary vasculature never increase above 30 millimeters of mercury. So that spares the right heart and the lung isn't subjected to high hydrostatic pressures. So in order to, uh, on the ventilation side, in order to accomplish this high mechanical efficiency, the tidal volume, the frequency, the lung volume from which you take each breath, the lung volume where you end each breath, the frequency, the, the timing of breathing has to be perfect. And it's perfect, absolutely perfect. As if each breath was sculpted <laughs> to be both precise and have a mechanical efficiency. And of course, that's up to the control system central nervous system to do that. So uh, I guess in general, the, the response to my question is, it's a highly precise and highly mechanically efficient response of every element of the respiratory system. Wow. And it's so incredibly, it must take a, a lot of regulation, yeah? The, the embarrassing thing is that here in a normal person, healthy person, untrained person, say, increases their ventilation uh, 20 fold from rest to maximum exercise. And we don't know what the underlying mechanisms are. <laughs> we know what some of them can contribute a little bit, but we don't know what the relative proportions of I'm each glad, are. I'm glad you actually said that because I, I used to teach um, 
So I was in the medical school at Monash and at Melbourne Uni, and um, that it'd always be like, oh, he's going to teach respiration. Oh, you're an exercise guy, and you know you huff and puff when you exercise. You can go and teach that. So I just always find it so complicated, and I'd always think, I don't really understand fully what's going on, you know. And um, I'm glad you don't either. <laughs> well, <laughs> I hope it's not that hopeless on this end because I've I've been studying this for sixty years. Yeah. But it's the, the from the aspect of the control. We know a lot about the mechanics. We know a lot about the respiratory muscles. We know a lot about gas exchange in the lung. A lot of that's been, but why? What the underlying specific mechanism that links the CO two production of the muscles? to the yeah. amount we breathe, we do not know that specific mechanism. I wanted to just, you know, start introducing the, the, the idea of how the untrained people don't seem to be limited by the lungs, potentially, but the more trained you get, the more the lung may become some sort of okay. factor. So let's, let's take somebody who's uh, a VO, young, an adult male, Okay. The one that's usually tested in the lab. Okay. And there at uh, uh, VO2 max below 60 mils per kg. Okay. In a human. Yep. And um, uh, these people, the following evidence shows that the lung likely isn't a significant factor. One, their oxygen cost of their breathing is pretty low, as I said before. That's number one. Okay. It's... It costs something to breathe, but it's less than 10% of the total oxygen consumed. Yeah. So the respiratory muscles would have less than 10% of the total cardiac output. Okay. Then if we um, uh, look at their arterial blood gases, the PO2 never falls in those people and they never retain carbon dioxide. They hyperventilate substantially and um, the one inefficiency comes in that they widen the difference between the alveolar PO2 and the arterial PO2, which means that the exchange of oxygen becomes a little more inefficient. But they're hyperventilating so much, they raise the alveolar enough to keep the arterial PO2 constant. Just That's to clarify for some people, so we're talking about the, the, the oxygen concentration in the lungs, basically, the alveoli, which are the smallest units compared to the blood. So you're saying there's a there's a widening, so it's not quite equilibrating, yeah? That's correct. There's some, what happens in the alveolus is not completely realized in the arterial blood. Well, even at rest, you have five to 10 millimeters of oxygen difference between the alveolar oxygen partial pressure and the arterial. And in a, a healthy, young, untrained person at max exercise, that'll widen two and a half times to 25 millimeters of mercury sink. Mm -hmm. But you never see the arterial PO2 fall because the alveolar is rising sufficiently to compensate for yeah. the wide alveolar. But, but it is a sign of it of some inefficiency. And we know, for example, where does that inefficiency come from? Well, it it's most likely uh, a little more non-uniformity in how blood and gas are distributed in the lung. This accounts for that most of, almost all of that widening of the alveolar arterial difference. It doesn't have to be much, you see, because the mixed venous oxygen is falling so much when you exercise. Mm -hmm. So you have to have a, if there are some imperfections in the lung, that'll show up in the alveolar to arterial oxygen difference. I hope that's clear. But the fact that it's not a limiting factor, it will only be limiting from a gas exchange point of view. So you have a, um, uh, you have a constant arterial PO2, CO2 is not accumulated, uh, the oxygen cost of breathing is minimal. Let's look in the pulmonary vasculature. Um, the, the, part, the pressure of blood in the pulmonary vasculature is about, at rest is about 10 millimeters of mercury, about one-tenth than it is in the uh, systemic vasculature. And when you exercise, the resistance to flow decreases in the pulmonary as well as the systemic vasculature. So you never see the, the pulmonary uh, vascular pressure rise more than about three times at the very most above resting levels, at least in the untrained person, say at a cardiac output of 20 liters a minute. So if you take all those facts and then the airways, let's take the airways, 
their ability to produce flow and volume is huge. It's got there's a huge reserve there compared to what the, the maximum oxygen consumption demands at say 100, 110 liters of ventilation. So if you take all those factors together, there's very, very small, if any, contribution of the total respiratory system, all aspects of it, to uh, max VO2. Yeah, so that's, that's, a common, in, that's a common misconception, right? So people go for a run or whatever, and they just say, oh, my lungs are you know, burning, which I don't even know what that means. But, you know, just, oh, just my lungs, you know, I need to, I need a big lung. They think it's their lungs that are limiting them. But that's probably this the thing they're most aware of. But it's not the lungs for most, you know. People. Well, I mean, you, you when you exercise, really, but in a healthy person, you have to exercise quite heavily to f even be aware of your breathing, don't you? I mean, yeah. you can be, your ventilation can increase five to seven times to eight times its resting level before you're even, yeah. your cortex becomes aware of your breathing. So this dyspnea or shortness of breath is only the extreme workloads. And it, it I mean, that might give you a symptom. Mm -hmm. It is a symptom for sure. That's not pleasant, but it doesn't stop you from exercising. All right. So you would you know, say- a person, a person with lung disease, that's a whole different story. Oh, sure. So you would say in pretty much all untrained people, even moderately trained, it's only very highly trained, elite sort of trained endurance people that the lung can be limiting. Is that right? Well, no, the, the, it, the question, the answer to whether the respiratory system is limiting changes when you change fitness level. Yep. The demand on the system. Does the capacity of the system change to equal the demand? Okay, so let me give you a couple of examples from nature. So if and these, these were studies done in the 80s and 90s, different animals of, of uh, the same size, but different fitness level. So you compare a pronged horn antelope to a small dog. Okay, the pronged horn antelope has a VO2 max of about 350 milliliters per kilogram, average. Wow. Okay. And if you take out its lung, its heart, its locomotor muscles, its respiratory muscles, and you'll see that, like for example, in the, uh, the volume of mitochondria in the locomotor muscles is upregulated three and a half to four times in the act of the, the highly fit animal compared to the sedentary one. If you look at the lung, you'll see that the alveolar capillary surface is also upregulated about three and a half times. No. So a, a guy by the name of Evald Weibel, uh, he just died uh, late last year. A Swiss studied all these in animals for along with some colleagues from Harvard and Texas over the years and saw this in the prong current antelope. He called it symorphosis that all organ systems upregulate together. Well, there are probably more exceptions to that rule than there are uh, uh, rules. For example, let's take the, uh, let's start with the human. Now the human, when they train, you'll see, you know this better than I, you'll see increased red cell mass. You'll see an increased compliance of the left ventricle and thickness of the left ventricle and size. Mm -hmm. You'll see increased capillary density in muscle. You'll see increased volume of mitochondrial and all aerobic enzymes in muscle. All of these are greatly upregulated. But if you look at the lung function, you don't see that kind of change. Yep. So for example, if you take uh, either a rodent or a human and train them for a year. And there have been several studies like that that have actually measured some aspects of, of uh, respiratory function. Very few, actually. But you don't see any change. Mm -hmm. Even in the rodent, right after weaning, you start to exercise him on a wheel. And you see all these other changes we just talked about in other systems, but not there. The best one I, I can think of, and I just looked it up again not long ago, was the bed rest and training study of uh, Saltine and Mitchell and there's a, another author on there that's never mentioned, Bob Johnson, his name, R.L. Johnson. He was the respiratory guy on that study. 
Okay. They never include respiratory people in training studies because they ain't the lung well, well, who cares? Mm -hmm. Then he measured the diffusion capacity of the lung in those people. And the fascinating thing to me was, if you look, let's go the other way now, and you have them bed rest for six weeks, and the VO2 max fell 28%, something like that. It's a huge fall over that six week period. The diffusion and, and the VO2 max fell. The VO, the diffusion capacity of the lung didn't change at all. Yeah, yeah. So there's a big dissociation between right VO2 max and lung function. And then when they retrain the people, up goes all these other factors that we talked about on the positive side now, but the diffusion capacity didn't change at all. Yeah. If you look at at highly trained athletes, uh Highly trained endurance runners, rowers. Rowers have larger lungs anyway because such large people. But let's just take the highly trained endurance runner. There's really very little difference in the diffusion capacity of the lung between those, those two. Swimmers are an exception. But the little bit of evidence that's available is very little, very little longitudinal evidence. The cross-sectional evidence indicates that it's most likely that they brought that lung to the event yeah. rather than the event bring it to the lung. Okay. But we don't know that for sure because there's, there's not a lot of long, real longitudinal human data. So that's the, that's the kind of evidence. And the, the best example is the thoroughbred horse who um, has an average VO2 max of 160 mils per kg. So that's double the high yeah. fit human. Right. And their lung is the major, no doubt, is the major limiting factor to their exercise. For example, what you see is they get very, very hypoxemic, even in moderate exercise. They retain carbon dioxide. Their arterial CO2 goes up into the high 50s, even 60 millimeters of mercury. So they're not ventilating enough. Their pulmonary arterial pressure. Uh, goes up to 125 millimeters of mercury. It's higher than a human systemic arterial pressure. Wow. The right heart ventricle is thicker than the left heart. Okay. Wow. The work of breathing, they're obligate nasal breathers, which makes no sense at all. It's a high resistance pathway, but they do that. And so these animals with their small gene pool, right? These are thoroughbreds. You don't see these in other horses. They, they, I don't know whether you'll, you ever see evolution long enough, but they were built for speed and uh, their hearts, I mean, you're talking 500 liters a minute cardiac outputs and their skeletal muscles are, uh, the metabolism is fantastic and their mitochondrial density, uh, volumes and, and capillary densities as well but they're not their lungs. They were really left behind in this. So that's, if we, we're talking very specific groups here now, the young untrained human and the highly trained young adult human and animals like the thoroughbred horse. So but that's kind of the way, so if you say it's a lung bill for exercise, you would say, tell me who you want to talk about. Yeah, if yeah. it's a young, untrained human, for sure. If it's a highly, highly trained human, then the answer has to be that the lung's kind of left behind in the training effect. Yeah. So is it fair to say, therefore, that, that the lung has all this reserve in an untrained or moderately trained person, and then everything else sort of um, adapts, so the cardiovascular system adapts, the muscle adapts, etc., and they all sort of catch up to the point where there's no reserve anymore, and then it starts to, to cause a um, yeah. problem. That's, I think, a decent way to look at it. Yeah. Yep. yeah. So what does happen? So therefore, I mean, there's some, there's some intricacies in there that we can talk about if you want, but uh, that I don't have answers to. For example, the hypoxemia that occurs in some highly trained athletes, yep. why doesn't it occur in all of them? I don't know the answer to that. And why does it, why do we start to see it? during submaximal exercise, not just at max, it gets worse than maximum. I don't I don't know why that. Yeah, that's the really whole cool. demand versus capacity idea falls apart a little bit with that. So those are things I don't have answers to, but in general, 
what I gave you those examples before is the way I think of this. Now, somebody like Venta Pedersen, mm -hmm. okay? Uh, and uh, the Australian that she worked with to start this. Uh, he's Mark, in Sydney. But, Mark, yeah. Mark Fabrio, yeah. Oh, yeah. He's back in Melbourne. Great, great guy. Yeah, I know him. I know him. I think he's terrific. Um, and they I can edit that part out. You know, I told you I can edit it. I'll edit that bit out then. It's slightly <laughs> over 20, 20 years ago now that um, uh, those two kind of got the idea that the contracting muscle acted like an endocrine organ. Yep. And that the training effects are really perhaps most likely cross organ effects. Yep. And I, you know this literature, don't you? You know all the effects that they're seeing now, I not just it. within the muscle itself, but in the liver and in the brain and in the skin. And then, and yeah. so, so I was in, uh, in uh, Copenhagen in April celebrating um, uh, the uh, the centennial of the uh, August Crows oh, Nobel Prize. Yep. And they wanted me to talk on the lung because he'd done some fantastic work on the lung long before he'd done it on capillaries. You probably don't even know about it. He was the one that showed the lung passive diffusion occurred in the lung, not active transport. Okay, all right. That, that's a beautiful story. So um, I, I talked about the lung there. And at the end of it, I said, and there is this problem of a lack of real adaptation of training of the lung. Well, I walked out the hallway after the defense, I said, nice talk, but how can that possibly be true? Because every organ in the body responds to the training effect. Well, I think that um, that's that's got to be looked at a lot more carefully than it has today, because the evidence today indicates, at least in healthy people, this might not be true. Now, there's some exceptions. Shall we go into some of those, Glenn? Sure, yeah. Okay. Let's take aging. Okay. Now, aging isn't kind to any organ, especially the lung. Starting in your late 20s, the lung starts to lose elastic recoil. It gets floppier. The airways close earlier. The reserve of the airways for flow and volume is reduced drastically. The chest wall gets stiffer and the pulmonary vasculars get stiffer. So I know a lot happens in the cardiovascular system and in muscle with aging, but boy, the lung just gets hammered. So if you look over time, the VO2 max, say, in a 70-year-old uh, versus, say, a 30-year-old falls from untrained, 30 to, or from 45 milliliters per kilogram to 25. Okay. So the lung... Uh, can handle that even at that stage. You don't, the lung cell isn't a limiting factor. But if you train a lot mm. over a lifetime, uh, the lung starts to become a limiting factor because it will change that interesting long term. There are a couple of very nice long term studies, one out of Finland uh, over a 30 year period that did show an effect on lung function of highly active people versus those that weren't so active in a rural setting. And it was, it was significant, 15, 16%. Unfortunately, they didn't measure a lot of things you should measure, but just simple lung function, it, was, it made a difference. Uh, so that'll help stem some of this effect of a declining lung uh, as a limiting factor with aging. But in the highly, highly fit, when they're older, it becomes a, a, a limiting factor. I wonder if we could just make sure we, we don't give the wrong message here that um, in some ways it's sort of sounding like, oh, as you age, your lungs are, you know, um, deteriorating and, you know, there's no use exercising. Let's make sure we make it clear that, you know, that, that, that the limiting factor for most people as they age is probably inactivity, right? They need to do more exercise. Um, yeah. And, and for sure. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I'll, yeah, we're, I didn't think we were discussing that. Of course, of course it is. You need yeah, to stay yeah. mobile. You got to keep moving for sure. I am I know that. I'm older than the people in that study. Now, I don't know. <laughs> I, I, if I don't keep moving, I... But all I'm saying is, in fact, somebody asked me that at a meeting in, in Denmark not long ago, another meeting, so some pulmonary people, and they said, 
are you telling us that we shouldn't exercise? No. What I'm saying is if you maintain a high level of fitness, of course you'll be healthier and you'll do a lot better. It's just that the chances that the lung will be become a significant limiting factor are greater. Yeah. I hope the, that's clear. The 99 the, the longitudinal studies indicate that there's some definitely a training effect that we never saw in younger people, but you see it across the age band. It's there. And it'll protect you against the lung being a limiting factor in a lot of people. But in the highly, highly fit, the chances that they become the lung. Now, is the lung, is it like the thoroughbred horse that the lung becomes the limiting factor? Heavens no. Yeah. The cardiovascular system and skeletal muscle and red summer, all the rest of those are still highly, highly important factors that are limiting exercise. It's just that now the lung contributes its bit. No. Yeah, so it's really we're, oh, we're talking about clear. exactly. Yeah. We're, we're generally talking about you know if you're the very high range of fitness. So if you're a, a young person and you train like crazy endurance training, then the lung can become limiting. If you're an older person and you train a lot, the lung can be, become limiting. That's but correct. Ninety nine percent of people, it's not the limiting factor. It's the cardiovascular system. Just to yeah. make sure the difference, know. the little bit of difference. Those are those two examples you give are just fine. The little bit of difference is. We haven't seen yet in the healthy young person an effect of training at all on the lung. Mm -hmm. Okay, we can't see that. In the older person, the few longitudinal studies there are show definitely an effect of a habitual active lifestyle on the lung like there is on other organs that have positive effects on other organs as well. It's just that it's limited in, in its effect and its beneficial effect on the lung compared to other organs. Like you said earlier, I guess, maybe we've, we, we need to look at this more closely. It seems likely there must be something going on maybe in, in the younger people, but maybe it's just hard to pick it up. Is that, is that? Oh, I wonder, um, I wonder. And certainly Benta and her colleagues think that, and I, I, I don't doubt their beautiful work. I think it's there. And um, I think the chances of, of, of uh, uh, extra, chronic exercise training have an effect on the lung are much better maybe in the diseased lung. Right. Yeah. Uh, let me just, you're a muscle guy. I, for example, there the lung can grow and it can respond to stress. Let's take some examples. And I mean, the tools are there. We know now on the last, it's just in the last 15 years or so, that in the respiratory bronchioles, there are growth factors that are liberated there that affect the lung. Example, if you do a pneumonectomy on the lung, that's take out a portion of the lung. That gives the remaining lung more room to move inside the thorax. And over time, you'll see growth in that remaining lung, mainly in immature lungs. But even in the mature lung, there are examples of it. And it's, it's a mechanical effect of having greater uh, capacity to ability to expand in a, in a uh, open thoracic cavity. So there is an example, and there are many of them, dog models, human models. I uh, saw a really striking one a few years ago of CAT scans taken over time in a single case of a woman who had about a third of one lung removed. And you could see that lung growing over a 20-year period. Another example is chronic hypoxia. If you're born at sea level and you go up to high altitude and you're up there days and weeks and months, the diffusion capacity of the lung doesn't change. Okay. The lung becomes a limiting factor. We haven't talked about hypoxia yet, but it becomes a limiting factor, especially if you're fit, really a big limiting factor. But it, it doesn't do anything. But if you look at the native of high altitude or the person who is born at sea level, but moved up there during maturation, the diffusion capacity of their lungs is averages about double ours. It's a huge difference. Wow. In fact, when you see them exercise, and you measure this during exercise, the difference between the alveolar and arterial PO2 is barely, hardly measurable in the native, whereas ours is extremely wide at high altitude. So we have to ventilate like all get out extreme levels of dyspnea or shortness of breath on mountaintops. Not the native of high altitude. They don't have to hyperventilate, and they don't. Wow. Their chemoreceptors are quite different than ours. So 
Those are two examples, the pneumonectomy and chronic hypoxia, where these lung growth factors are very powerful and they can happen. It's just the question is whether this applies to exercise. Mm -hmm. And I've seen some data recently. Here's one in mice trained at very high levels. You see increase in mitochondria in lung, just like you would see in skeletal muscle. Yeah. It never occurred to me that that could occur in the lung. These changes were substantial. And they see increases in these factors that that the Pedersen lab has studied over the years. Irisin, released from the muscle into the bloodstream. They can see this in the in the uh, parench lung parenchyma actually changes. They can see um, hypoxic inducible factor expression increase in the lung parenchyma in a training animal. That This is all in the last few years. Mm -hmm. uh, this is very exciting. Yeah. Um, why you still can't see that in a healthy human young lung? I don't know why a change in function, for example, but those factors are there. Then um, some studies in older um, uh, smokers, oddly enough, over followed over a 20 year period with training. You can see beneficial effects in that lung. This is humans now, but not in the healthy lung again. See, this is weird kind of stuff. Okay. And the last one, and this is these are back to mice studies now. You take rodents and expose them to cigarette smoke over and over again. And you create, in a matter of weeks, you create emphysema. And that's, that's not one study now I've seen in the past five years, oh, a dozen like this. Then you do a crazy study. At the same time you start exposing the cigarette smoke, you start running them on a wheel. And the changes that they prevented in that diseased lung were unbelievable. I, it's, I said, oh, this is, this won't happen again. The next study showed the same thing. Next study showed the same thing. Wow. So again, yeah, yeah. See, that's, that's very curious to me. Yeah. And so um, I think this is a field well worth my lab's closed. It's not me that's going to investigate this, but I hope people follow this. Maybe we missed something in the young lung. I don't think so, though. But I'd love to be shown wrong there. But in the older, and maybe even the disease lung, like with COPD, because the COPD, here, asthma is a, is, a, is a really good example of this. And the asthmatic animal showed the same thing with exercise training. Good Lord, as I said, as showed you with there, said with the uh, chronic cigarette smoking, you can, exercise can invoke changes in these disease models. So if you look at the literature on, CO, on, uh, on asthma, the studies are not very good. There are lots of them, but they'll report uh, symptoms are better in an asthmatic. You train them, they're less symptomatic. Mm -hmm. Well, the reason for that most likely is, is that they, you're training the muscles. You've been able to train the locomotor muscles. If you can train them, you're going to decrease the drive to breathe. If you can decrease the drive to breathe in a diseased lung, you're going to decrease the symptoms of shortness of breath on exertion. Sure. Yep, that yeah. makes sense. So the, it doesn't say anything about whether the lungs change. Now, those studies can be done, but you've got to study the lung. And they're not studying the lung. Um, the, I know some studies are starting now in Copenhagen with pretty severe COPD people with a really high intensity training program. But they're doing things like looking like cardiovascular uh, scientists would really study the cardiovascular system thoroughly in their training studies. We need that done in the lung. These people in Copenhagen are starting these and I'm very anxious to see what they're finding. It's a long shot. But um, so those are some, okay. there's something and there's something there, but we don't know yet what it is in the effects of endurance exercise training and effects on the respiratory system. That's very interesting. All right. So it's interesting you brought up asthma. I wanted to bring that up as well. We've talked in the past, you and me, just at conferences and things about how a lot of asthmatics may not actually be asthmatic, maybe laryngeal oh, yeah. dysfunction, for example. I wonder if you can talk about that a little bit. Yeah. First, let me say that, that we know 
that the prevalence of asthma in the highly trained athlete, especially the elite endurance athlete, is very high. Yeah. We know, again, from not a lot of good studies, but a couple of real dandy ones where they took airway biopsies, that you can create an asthmatic airway in cross-country skiers. That's racing at very high training, at very high levels of ventilation in a cold, dry environment. You injure the, the airway epithelium is a very delicate structure. And when you have those very high flow rates, where dry, cold air, you dry the airway and you cool it. We never, we never used to think in the past that you could do that. We'd just go through the nasal passages and the upper airway. We'd, we'd warm it, and humidified everything, but not at those kind of flow rates that these highly trained athletes. So I think it's, it, it, it's no wonder that when an athlete complains of shortness of breath, uh, there's something wrong with my lung, doctor, mm -hmm. that asthma is a good place to look first. Yeah. Okay. Because the prevalence is there and high levels of, of training can affect that airway epithelium just as can affect the pulmonary vasculature. Same thing, another delicate structure. It's not meant to handle flow rates at those levels. Okay. 30 plus liters a minute cardiac output on the vasculature side, five, six liters per second, and 200 liters a minute ventilation on the airway side. Just not to mention a okay, day after. The, okay. So I wanted to get make sure that was that was there. Now, but you're right. A lot of complaints, and I've I've just become aware of this literature in the last, say, 15 years, that and, and let me give you a, a personal anecdote. I was teaching an undergraduate class and uh, about a hundred uh, young, bright young scientists in it and um, talking about control of breathing in the class. And after class, this one very tall young woman, 19 years old, she was a national cyclist on the American cycling team. And she, uh, or was trying out for it. And the last three or four years, she'd been having a great deal of trouble in the final few hundred meters of the race, not every race, but a lot of them. And she was being treated for asthma. And every time she do this, she would go back to her physician. He'd give her more cortical steroids. She'd be okay for a couple and then it'd start again. So I sent her over to the, a guy at our place that I thought knew more about asthma than anybody. Cause I thought it was asthma too that she was talking about. So he gave her more cortical steroids. It happened again. So we brought her in our lab and we tested her. We put an arterial catheter in her, did the whole thing. And she, my God, she could pedal that bike. I forgot the number of watts, but it was almost going to set a lab record. She was really moving. And, uh, you know, we check with her every once in a while. We saw these flow rates. Her saturation was good. Taking arterial blood, the flow volume loops are going over. She got plenty of room in that flow volume loop. All of a sudden, her eyes just opened widely like mm -hmm. this. And you could see it on the flow volume loop. You could see the obstruction on the inspiration, which we never see in the airway. It's usually, if it's going to be anywhere, it's on expiration. Mm -hmm. And the blood gas, arterial PO started to fall and the CO2 started to rise immediately. And she stopped the exercise. Well, now we know from uh, after we looked into it, but not yet, we weren't the first, not by far. A lot of the Scandinavian. Uh, clinicians and, and respiratory scientists start to scope airways. And they're seeing now that it's not the intrathoracic airway that was a problem in a lot of these. And remember, at the outset, I said the intrathoracic lung airway is a problem in a lot of these, but a lot of them it isn't. It's the extrathoracic airway. The muscle in the extrathoracic airway is not smooth and voluntary muscle like the the, the, the constricts in an asthmatic. Right, can I just injury? clarify for people? So we're talking about the you know the thoracic is in the in the chest. So you're talking yeah, about from the that larynx side. down, yeah, exactly. larynx the glottis down exactly. in the chest, intrathorax, right? Um, but the control of this of this upper airway is entirely different. The regulation of its caliber is entirely different than the regulation of this. We're now starting to find out. I might, I might add to that, that whenever 
the respiratory physiologists never paid any attention to the upper airway yeah. until, uh, gosh, it's over 45 years ago now, we discovered sleep apnea. And we said, my God, you go to sleep and that upper airway doesn't look, there's a lot of other reasons too, but that upper airway is not well controlled. You lose control of it. And so now we know a lot more about that upper airway. Now, so there's a, it looks like not enough uh, people have been, uh, athletes have been studied yet, but it looks like a significant number, I'll just put it at that number, of athletes that have uh, extreme shortness of breath uh, during heavy intensity exercise have problems with controlling the caliber of the upper airway mm -hmm. and not the lower or intrathoracic airway, or sometimes both. But they should definitely be evaluated rather than just treated with more so uh, is, it fair, is it fair to say, I know you didn't put a number on it, but I've, I've sort of read here and there it's, that it could be sort of 50% even of people that think they've got asthma may actually have laryngeal dysfunction or is that? Uh, I don't know. It's a lot. It's a lot. So yeah, I haven't seen. I've, I've tried to follow those studies pretty well. Mm -hmm. And that article of mine from 2020, the author Hull, is an expert in this. He's an expert uh, from uh, London, UK. He's uh, he studied this, and a good friend of mine, uh, Emil uh, Schwartz in um, uh, Copenhagen, has studied hundreds of these people, and the Norwegian respiratory people have studied a few hundred too. And I I honestly can't say that the the prevalence, yeah, it's, but it's not like it's this minor. It's, it's not like this. I just want to clarify. It's not like. You know, oh, most people that think they have asthma have asthma. We're talking about a significant proportion. Yes, we are. Of athletes. Of athletes. Of athletes. Yeah. And it's an exercise-induced thing. Yeah. Just like asthma can be exercise-induced. It's funny because as, as we've talked about, when I, I used to be a distance runner and I, I'd always be running and I'd be going, <gasps> and everyone would say, oh, mate, you've got so much ticker. And it, and it wasn't, you know, they thought I was just hurting the whole time, but it was, I couldn't get the air in, you know. But then I got diagnosed later with, exercise induced asthma and i started yeah. thinking hey, here, hang on is it laryngeal dysfunction or so and the interesting thing as you said people don't tend to the respiratory physicians tend to think about the lungs only they don't think about anything up here so i yeah. had to go to an ear nose and throat person to, to, to say That's what's right. happening in my throat i was getting laryn laryngitis and stuff and and i'd say but is it oh, i don't know anything about the lungs the ear nose and throat i don't know anything about the lungs and then the lung person i don't know anything about the throat and it's like Aren't they both the respiratory system? You know, like, is it asking too much to expect a little bit of, you know? Well, I think now, I think that the specialization has changed. Uh, if I can go back to the sleep apnea examples now, all kinds of respiratory physicians, in fact, the major of all the reasons, symptoms, complaints that people show up at a sleep laboratory now and sleep medicine's a huge industry yeah 75 percent of those are sleep apnea mm. so the respiratory physicians oh, could yeah. no longer avoid getting involved with that they now know a lot about the upper airway and producing some really if i may say so and producing some pretty nice studies on it yeah, now think about exercise though do they think about exercise that's another no. yeah right mm -hmm. combine them so uh the reasons this happens uh some are fairly clear um i've seen cases of uh and beyond that case study i haven't studied that beyond that time uh i've done more other things but a lot related to it but um i knew the people that they really had it they're scoping these athletes yeah uh, again the thoroughbred horse is a beautiful example of that and my first one i saw that was in uh sydney uh years ago on a horse running on a treadmill outside with a veterinarian scope and all oh, just another thing about the thoroughbred horse how crappy their lungs are their upper airway are are undergo all kinds of neuropathies that long airway they have in the in the horse and they have all kinds of laryngeal dysfunction and upper airway problems uh, again they're obligate nasal breathers really goofy that an animal that's bred for speed should be like that. So maybe maybe they need forward. to wear nasal strips. Yeah. Well, there was one study that I know of that was done with that. It improved substantially. Uh, <laughs> took away a lot of the high work of breathing that they had. Yeah. I don't know whether they, 
that would ever become a staple in the racing industry. Or no, I think we've got to get a racehorse, you and me, and um, take the nasal strips but, off the off the owners. It, and put on the even if you did that, it would still not. You'd still have a lung that couldn't handle five hundred liters a minute cardiac output. Yeah, but they and might beat the other them. horses though. They might still beat yeah, the other. Well, yeah. <laughs> it won't because you'll bleed into the lung, All and right. that lung will be scarred. Yeah. But it might beat the other horses without the strip. Sure, that's possible. <laughs> yeah. I better edit that. That whole field of uh, the role of the upper airway and and for that matter, the asthmatic airway too. The, the good, the, the, there's a, a real effect of physical training, a real potential benefit of physical training on the asthmatic airway. Right. The problem is that people have to study this and study the lung when they do it, not just ask them symptoms or do a simple forced expiratory volume, but they have to study the lung. It's reactivity, for example. Do thorough, and nobody's doing those. Nobody's okay. doing them. If they're not, I, I'm not gonna say they're easy studies to do, but they're, they're a lot harder than the studies that have been reported to date. But it really, it's like, I talked about um, training studies in, in COPD, not, not thorough. Not thorough at all. Not like they would be in other disciplines. You really need to be. Yep. And asthma. Asthma is the big one. I think the one study we want to do a really good study on childhood asthma uh, training. And again, here's a whole different thing. In, tra in, in training the asthmatic, my guess would be that the positive effects, if they're there on the lung, if they're there, are going to come with moderate exercise training. Okay. Not exposing that lung to the high flow rates of uh, the high high intensity training. I think that would not be the place to start, although that's something you could test. So, just so that would be my prediction. Just one thing you've touched on a couple of times that, you know, it sounded like you were saying the lungs and the airways are not really built for these massive flow, like 200 liters a minute for hours on end and whatever. And the pulmonary vasculature, too. Yeah. Okay. So that's interesting because, you know, with um, Ben Levine last week we talked about you know can extreme exercise damage the heart and whatever so you're actually saying that the the heart and lungs potentially well fo focus on the respiratory system it yeah. may not actually be good for them to be doing this really sort of extreme really high levels of exercise so yeah i've given you two two remember we i guess we've glenn we've talked about two sides of this one does the lung adapt in a positive way right. but now we're on the topic of might it, if it doesn't adapt in a pot, might it actually maladapt? Right. Right. And the two examples that suggest that perhaps it does are the pulmonary vasculature and the intra and extra thoracic airways. Well, let's not do extra because we don't know the mechanism for that yet, the upper airway. But the inner airway, that those high flow rates, especially in a cool environment or say a swimming pool environment with high chlorine, concentrations in the air right. that lung is damaged and those training tiles can be talking about the, the real elite guys you, yeah, yeah. and and create and, and and that could be the reason why there are so many um uh asthmatic athletes the person to is sandy anderson who's in sydney okay uh, she i think has done more to shed light on the athlete's asthmatic airway than anybody. Okay. And she has taught the rest of us about this uh, injury repair process that can change that airway with training. Andre Lagerche is a Melbourne guy who you told me you're gonna get, and he's the one, along with some people in the Netherlands, that have shown us how high these pressures can get at 30 plus liters per minute cardiac output. When, when Andre and I talked about this years ago, I said, Andre, is, is the pulmonary vasculature not built for exercise? Oh, he said, yeah, as long as you keep your cardiac health under 20 liters a minute. Wow. You know, it's, um, yeah, and he's she's showing some, and he'll talk about this with much more knowledge than I have about the long-term clinical effects, potentially, of, of this. So, yeah, yeah. I, uh, there's some evidence of maladaptation, especially at the high levels. Okay. Yep. But again, yep. we don't want to scare people off. Most people, 
should exercise yep. almost all. Yeah, absolutely. Good for you, Glenn. Thanks for coming back to that all the time. <laughs> it's, like the, it's like the young woman said to me in Copenhagen at the end of my talk about aging. She said, should we be telling old people not to exercise? No, <laughs> no, 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 no. no. <laughs> Goodness gracious. And thank you for bringing that up. That's for right. sure. Hey, um, okay, one thing we, we haven't touched on is when we talk about the lung doesn't, the respiratory system doesn't really adapt to exercise. Um, I guess we, we haven't talked about what you've looked at a lot, which is the respiratory muscles. They, of course, uh -huh. being normal muscles, they adapt to exercise. Can we just talk about that a bit, the diaphragm? Yeah. yeah. Oh, okay. No. Yeah. Um, um, I can remember the real nice studies in the rodent that uh, uh, the Scott Powers did in the 90s, showing that the uh, diaphragm looked like the uh, soleus, the way it was, you know, it changes. And they maybe not quite as much, but very similar with the training, very high intensity training in the room. So, and now we know um, uh, in the last couple of decades, the, the use of respiratory muscle training itself, just sitting down, training a uh, half hour a day through a resistor, very, very, um, uh, high levels of the work of breathing. You can certainly train those respiratory muscles. I always thought that that the respiratory muscles were oh, kind of non-fatigable. Mm -hmm. And then in 1993, Bruce Johnson and I used a technique developed in Montreal to, uh, just like you would if you wanted to know whether the quadriceps fatigued, mm -hmm. you'd do a supermaximal stimulation of the femoral nerve and measure the force output, right? Before and after exercise, she'll fatigue all the time. We have to get, it was a little more difficult with the, with the diaphragm. We had to stimulate the phrenic nerves up right. here in the neck and measure the force output by putting a balloon in the esophagus and another one in the stomach to measure the preference difference across the diaphragm. And when we did that, we found that everybody, fit and unfit, if you exercise at a very, very high level to exhaustion, you don't see it with just a, a normal incremental exercise test over a few minutes to exhaustion. But if you go at a high level where the respiratory muscles works maintained at a high level over a period of time, you'll see it fatigue. And it'll fatigue about, you don't have to go to the end of the exercise, but partway through it, you'll start to see fatigue develop. So it does fatigue. So um, it also does train. So yeah, you can, you can train it. Yeah. Yeah, and you found even, um, I was a bit surprised, but you found sub-maximum exercise to exhaustion. You could improve the time to exhaustion by doing diaphragm and spiritual muscle sort of. Training. Yeah, well, I'm not the best one for that. In fact, the study we did, um, we did a placebo. We were the first ones to do a placebo with it. Or <laughs> we, um, we gave one group a, a trainer, a regular trainer with a, it's a commercial device now they sell that you can increase the resistance like breathing through a straw, only different levels. Yeah. And we gave another group something that looked like that, only with a little plastic container that we put colored gravel in the bottom of it. Okay, this was our placebo yeah. group. And we said, we said to the training group, you go home and you train with this kind of regimen that we gave them every day, a few minutes. But in the placebo group, you have to breathe very normally at a very slow pace, 30 minutes a day. And um, uh, if you do that, you'll see these pebbles here in this little container, they'll absorb oxygen. It'll be like hypoxic training. Well, they'd all heard of it. This is a lie. They'd yeah. all heard of hypoxic training. Deceptive. Of course, Deceptive. So this is a terrific placebo. And we did see a placebo effect. Okay. okay. Perfect. So we saw not very much effect of the respiratory muscle training at all, but others have. So but oh, let's be clear on just how much of an effect it is. Uh, when you do it really well, they did a better, I think the others have done a, a lot of others, have done a better job of training it. They didn't do a better job of the, of the placebo. We were the champions of the placebo. Oh, good but they, there are some early claims of 25, 30 changes in endurance exercise capacity with their full muscle training. That just isn't true. That's not true. We get three, four, 5% changes in the time trial performance, endurance time trial performance. That's substantial. But yes, you can. Uh, you can train the respiratory muscles and, and 
Now, why should that be? Well, it could be that it's a Benton Pedersen effect, that these muscles are just like locomotor muscles, that you're going to produce um, cytokines and myokines, and what do they call them now, exercise kinds out of these muscles, and have a training effect. And there's some suggestion lately from SEALs and some people out in Arizona that respiratory muscle training can even affect blood pressure in this way. We'll see how that goes. Um, but it certainly indicated that. So the other way you can do it, if you have more highly trained respiratory muscles, then when you're exercising, you know, whole body exercise, the um, uh, muscles will not fatigue as early. The respiratory muscles will not. They're more highly trained. Therefore, and we haven't talked about this yet, you won't increase sympathetic uh, metaboreceptor sympathetic activation from these muscles. See, these muscles will activate sympathetics just like the locomotor muscles will. And we think when you do that, it'll cause sympathetic vasoconstriction of the limbs. Oh. So that's a mouthful I just gave you there. Now, right. why do we think that? Well, uh, some time ago now, it's almost a couple of decades now, we exercised a highly trained cyclist and we put them on, a, uh, on control conditions and then we gave them resistor to breathe through to increase the work of breathing. And we gave, we had a special ventilator that the person had invented to unload their work of breathing, decrease it by about 60% during heavy exercise. So even at 180 liters a minute, we could reduce the work of breathing by more than half. And it was a highly instrumented study. We did thermal dilution measurements of blood flow in the limbs, arterial pressure, esophageal pressures, work of breathing, all that stuff. <clears throat> When we increase the work of breathing, we decrease the blood flow in the limb, increase vasoconstriction. Wow. When we decrease the work of breathing, we increase blood flow to the limb. Now, why, why does that happen? Well, given a lot of pre prior literature, prior that including some of our own uh, studies in, in running dogs, just like there's a metaboreceptor from the locomotor muscles, these same receptors exist in the diaphragm. Okay. And just like the phrenic nerve has all kinds of, of motor fibers, it has even more sensory fibers that go from the diaphragm to the brainstem. So when you start to accumulate metabolites in the respiratory muscles, you'll increase activity of the brainstem, which will increase sympathetic nerve activity. And that's the effect we think. If you, so the hypothesis would be, if you train those respiratory muscles, they will be, be more fatigue resistant. You won't activate these metaboreceptors so quickly and you'll get better blood flow distribution of the limbs. Oh, just shows that's, again- That's how the thing. Everything. It just shows again how integrative everything is, yeah? Oh, that, sure, yeah. You know, we people don't think of, of respiratory muscles as of, of having sensory input to the brain, which yeah. we know the limbs certainly do. and. And, and, and uh, uh, Mark Kaufman, Janine Hill, a postdoc of his, many years ago, well, not that many, measured the type 3, 4 receptor afferents in the diaphragm and showed that fatiguing it in an anesthetized rat, the way of doing that, increased the activity of those 3, 4 afferents, just like you'd see in the, limb, in the locomotor mm -hmm. muscles. It probably doesn't take completely fatiguing them to do that but just worrying them hard will do it so that's the hypothesis now yeah okay. of why respiratory muscles training might be helpful but what i think is interesting is how it's now being applied to say heart failure patients big effects there and even some copd studies big effects on exercise performance there so what are you saying there part that? of that is changing the distribution of blood flow what are you saying there sorry the the what are they finding with the heart failure patients? That they'll increase exercise performance with training the respiratory muscles. Oh, with the respiratory muscles. Wow. Well, yeah. Okay. Yep. All right. Now, just yeah, that's a, yeah. um, we'll probably start thinking about finishing up soon. This has been great. But one thing I know we talked about in our little pre chat was um, some, some sort of sex differences. So, um, oh, yeah. You know, yeah. 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 
So in the mid nineties, um, uh, I had a, a, a wonderful postdoc named Craig Harms come to the lab. And I was giving him all these studies on upper airways and sleep apnea and doing <laughs> sleeping dog studies. And he did a nice job. Finally, he came to me one day, he said, Jerry, I, 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 those are good studies. I've learned a lot of physiology, but I didn't come here to study sleep apnea and upper airways. I came here to study exercise. Now let's get a project where, oh, I said, geez, I'm sorry. I was getting so carried away with what you're doing. You're right, let's think it up. But I, I, hadn't, I hadn't done a lot of human exercise studies for a few years at that point. And I thought, uh, I'm not sure what to do. And then later that same week, um, we have a very, very good track and field team at Wisconsin, especially for a Northern University. They do very well in the NCAAs and um, produce some really, some Olympians. And um, a woman had, had uh, ran a certain time, I think this, the 1800 meters and another one, the 1500 meters. I remember looking at that and I remember turning to my wife and I said, women can't exercise like that. I had no idea they had these kind of time. And of course, my wife said to me, that's because you're not paying attention. You just think you're an old guy and you just think they're backward. They should be playing one half court basketball or something. So uh, I, started, I started looking at this a little more and I thought, you know, we saw those athletes, uh, this is 10 years before that, a number of them show this hypoxemia when they exercise. I wonder if women show that. How fit are these women? So we got a, a bunch of them in. We start the, I think we ended up studying about 60 of them. And we actually did arterial catheterization in more than half of them. And uh, from normally fit all the way up to one Olympian, a 40-year-old 1,500-meter Olympian who had a VO2 max of 71 mils per kg. That's pretty good. That's really good. That's pretty good. And she was 40. She and she didn't. She wasn't a medal winner. She was fourth in the uh, Los Angeles Olympic Games, fifteen hundred meters. It's a famous one, one by Zola Bud. Oh yeah, Look, the barefoot South runner. Africa. The barefoot. The Mary Slaney got knocked into the infield, and here's our lady from fourth place. Okay, so we studied them, and we found that these women, um, uh, a number of them had. Um, hypoxemia, even with VO2 maxes in the 50s, we hadn't seen that in men before. Uh, it wasn't that their prevalence of it was higher than it was men, but just that they were occurring when they had lower VO2 maxes. Mm. Kind of interesting, right? Yeah. And um, then we studied their, their flow limitation during exercise. Here's their flow volume loop, and where do they fit within it? How much reserve do they have? Yeah. Well, we found they didn't, they didn't have a whole lot. Even with women with the um, same size as men, the same lung volume, that's how you have to compare them. And there's a paper by a very famous uh, breathing mechanics guy, Jerry Mead at Harvard, 30 years before, that suggested from some simple measurements that adult, young adult women had, um, uh, what was the term? I can't remember the term, I'm sorry, but smaller diameter airways at a given lung volume. Wow. So we started to look very carefully at their mechanics during exercise. And that happened. They got into flow limitation at much lower ventilations than men, even if the lung volumes were similar. Okay. Their airways, they're larger. These are not small airways, but they're larger. And these are intrathoracic, inside the lung airways at the main biorefications. Their airways were, were smaller, smaller diameter, and um, which indicated that. We didn't actually measure it. Then Bill Scheele, a postdoc of mine, when he went back to Vancouver, actually did some imaging. And those studies are ongoing, but he's showing this now, uh, that uh, the airways of uh, young women, not they don't have to be athletic, just young women. And it seems to occur um, during pubescence. Uh, men's airways keep growing, and women's airways kind of plateaued. So that's an interesting factor. Then if you, if you add that to say aging, uh, and a sex difference. It might even be a greater difference. So those studies are kind of ongoing now. Bill Shield, a number of his 
students are um, are following this up. I, I think it's a, a really interesting sex difference that's uh, definitely there. It's really weird because um, you think about it, um, you know, sometimes there's this debate, are the females ever going to catch up to the to the males and whatever? With, oh, yeah. You know, and they, and they yeah. tend to be getting closer, it feels like it, with endurance. But, you know, this, it still looks like they'll never catch up. And when you look at it, it's kind of weird because they, they not only have, like you said, these potentially uh, airways that are small, but they also have like lower hemoglobin, yeah, uh, concentration. Yeah. It's, it's like yeah, it's like they smaller they, left ventricle for a given heart size. Yeah, a lot of that. Yeah, yeah. yeah exactly. And I don't muscle is certainly. Uh, what which fiber is it? Do you know that's different in women than men? Are the type it's... one fibers? Less percentage of type one fibers. I do not know that. Sorry, I didn't. Okay, know well, no, I'm I'm just guessing. Yeah. I heard a talk by Sandra Hunter, who studied sex differences last uh, Saturday, on a, okay. a symposium on the science of running, and and she brought up a lot of these uh, physiological differences, accounting for a good deal of the difference between men and women. But there was a lot she couldn't account for either uh, between them. But yeah, that's I think the the lung is certainly the airways and. And um, uh, this difference in airway size might be a, a significant factor. Again, one of the factors is a limitation of many. Ah, oh, Sandra Hunter. It's interesting you mentioned her. She's actually agreed to give a talk. So, good. I think she'd be good value. I, I I learned a lot from her talk. Right. All right. And the just the other thing. Someone sent a question on Twitter. I, I don't not sure if it's right or not. But said that um, females have more upper airway tract infections is that do you know if that's a thing oh that's yeah that was a, a very good um females and younger adolescents seem to have a fairly high prevalence now my friend in one of them i got the guy in england hull and uh emil and uh Copenhagen, I think they might differ on it. One of them has told me, not sure that's holding up the more that they study. But that's that's the thinking of a number of people now that it seemed to occur. The the, the case study we did was a young female. Yeah, but uh, that doesn't say anything. So we don't know um, why or you don't, if, yeah, it is, yeah, if but, it is. So that's uh, um, whether this problem with the intrathoracic airways is also present. Of course, we don't know the reason that these upper airways are showing these, these, this narrowing with heavy exercise. If we knew more about that other than extra mucosal tissue that, and by the way, surgery can deal with that quite nicely, but the rest of it, they can't. The, 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 the treatments I don't think are, are far from being worked out. But yeah, it, it might be true of both sets of airways. Yep, it might be. All right, well, thank the you very much. Things always tough, yeah. What's that? To, to, to get a real good number on prevalence is always hard. I've only worked with one epidemiological study uh, here over a 10-year period on sleep apnea, and we ended up having to study 2,400 people every four years over a 10-year period to get a handle on prevalence. It's a tough thing to do, well, you know, yeah. randomization and all of that. Yeah, yeah. So, hey, thank you very much for your time. You're actually um, 84 years old, and you retired at 82. So you've been uh, doing, doing, you said at one stage, you've been doing this for 50 years or something. So amazing career. And I just wanted to say, what do you actually do nowadays? You're still running around. You've been at conferences lately and. Uh... Yeah, I, I th they have like a, a dinosaur uh, version uh, that some of these conferences and, uh, but th there's still, yeah, there's still enough people interested in the lung and I've been advising a few young people um, either virtually or and now more recently in person on some of their studies, uh, giving my two cents worth. No, you're not and actually you're tired. You're not a actually... little bit of te classroom teaching as well, a little bit, but no more. I don't have a lab anymore other than that. I miss, I, miss, I miss having trainees a lot. Yeah. So are you yeah. retired or not? Not really. They don't pay me, but that's <laughs> okay. That's the difference. Like, that's kind of like you. That's okay, but I don't think I'll go into the podcast business. You, 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 you're doing a good job with that, Glenn. Keep it up. <laughs> well, I, I, I stopped work at 58, which is quite, kind of strange. I don't know if I'm done or not, but um, I feel bad when I talk to guys like you and Claude Bouchard's going to come on. That sort of you know retire at 82. 
<laughs> please don't please don't feel bad i it's such a personal decision yes right i mean i i've stopped being being paid at something like 75 or something 70 or so i can't remember now it's been so long just yeah. because i thought i didn't want to do uh, a load of the same load i have at the classroom teaching anymore and i just didn't think it's right to keep a position at the university and not do that but the grant still paid for it you know year after year after year so but it's a very personal thing um and some of us find that um yeah we can't leave them alone i just can't i'm just writing three manuscripts right now and i'm helping the two or three or four young guys do their stuff and i'll go back to my old university like i did last fall and teach a little more i hope this mm -hmm. uh, uh this fall it's it's great stuff and uh but I have other colleagues, three I can think of right off the top of my head, who I work with for 45 years. They've retired. They don't even want to talk. To, oh, yeah. One guy, I got him to my very close colleague, got him to write a uh, review paper with me about 10 years ago. And uh, a few years later, they they called me up and said, would you do a, a, an upgrade on that? Tell us what's going on. Oh, great. So I phoned my old pal. He said, nope, I'm done. I'm done. <laughs> so it's it, to each his own, right, Glenn? Oh, it's fair enough. I, I can say I'm retired, but I've just had an e-book on exercise metabolism come out, and uh, I'm doing these yeah. podcasts, and I've still got one more six-month visit to Copenhagen you mentioned earlier, the University of Copenhagen. Wonderful. Next year. So who knows? Okay, well, thanks again, Jerry. It's been fantastic. Great See talking you. to you, Glenn. It's been a long time. Okay. See you. Yeah.